Well, I'm uh, Pastor Dana, and I am your tour guide as we have been digging deeper and going under the surface of who we are as people, and in particular thinking about it as the people of God in this world. Let's listen again to what Jesus says to his disciples as he teaches them about life. And everything I've taught you is so that the peace which is in me will be in you and will give you great confidence as you rest in me. For in this unbelieving world, you will experience trouble and sorrows, but you must be courageous, for I have conquered the world. Now the peace that Jesus is speaking of in the Hebrew shalom, it's where everything is in harmony. So whenever you see the word peace in the Bible, you can uh, use the word harmony and it's probably a better understanding uh, in terms of the way we look at that word today. And, and this harmony comes because God is in our life. And harmony occurs where the things of God and what God wants are the things that we want. Well, Jesus says, I have that harmony with God, and I am offering it to you. As you rest in me, as you abide in me, as you soak yourself in the power of the Holy Spirit, I give you confidence to face whatever life brings. Now, life is hard, especially in a world that doesn't follow the ways of God. And so we expect trouble, we expect sorrow, we expect brokenness. But Jesus doesn't try to keep us safe. Notice he doesn't try to keep us insulated from the world. Instead, he says, rest in me. And then he offers us courage as the sign of a godly life. Courage, not being safe, but being courageous. And this is exactly who we can be because Jesus has already conquered the world. He has conquered sin and death and the power of the devil. He has conquered through his death and resurrection. And this resurrection power that's available now becomes clearer and clearer when we move forward in becoming our best true selves. Now during these last several weeks, we've been looking into the foundation stories of who we are as human beings. It's certainly been helpful for me to be given insights, not only through the Holy Spirit and the scripture and so forth, but insights from the teachings of Jordan Peterson, for instance, and from the teachings and discussions we have on our weekday Bible studies, because we go through these texts that I preach on Sunday, the prior week. One of the main things that we've been discovering is that the book of Genesis is a treasure map of the adventure called life. By looking at life through the lenses of the stories of people like Cain and Abel, Noah, Jacob, and today Joseph, we see something larger than just Sunday school stories. When we look closer, we see real people with all their flaws facing real situations in the real world. Now, last week, we were introduced to the patriarchs. Now, this is a term that we use in Scripture, the men and women whom God chooses to specifically bring blessings to the world in more intentional ways. From the lives of Abraham and Sarah and onward, God focuses more specifically on a group of people whom God says are blessed to be a blessing. Right away, we see that the Bible is anything but a bunch of fairy tales. Instead, this is what we witness. We witness real people who are living out real situations in a real world. And, and what is God telling them? God is telling them, hey, get out of your house of your father and your mother and get a life. <laughs> Starting with Abraham, who doesn't leave till he's 70, 
And Jacob, he's like 40 and, and, and on and on. It, it, get out and make a life. Do something. Right away, we see a big problem. Making a life is hard. It's so much harder to think about making a life, making a real difference in the world for good than it is to try to avoid the obvious sins. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? You know, I'm not going to do that or I'm going to do that. No, no, I'm talking about aiming forward to become your best true self and to bless those around you in a specific way. To follow God who is leading you to places of adventure. Life is hard. See, what happens is life really centers around making moral decisions. And that's what we do all the time by our behavior and the actions that we take. These are always moral decisions. You can, you know, trust in God or not. It doesn't matter. You're still making moral decisions, decisions that affect you and affect those around you. It really centers on this. The way Peterson talks about it, he says, do you want to make things worse for yourself and other people, or do you want to make things better? The answer to that lies in what's your goal. The actions that we take as we live our lives in the real world result in making things better or making things worse. And then we look at these patriarchs, and we see that they're a mixed bag in all of this. Decisions that they make and the actions that they take are a mixed bag, to say the least. And guess what? We get to see family life. You think life is hard? Living in a family. Because every one of us has a family of one kind or another. And we see that family life often is where life really clashes with the human reality. I think of brokenness in families, and I think of, of, of the struggles and, 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 and the pain, and, and, and both on purpose or by neglect, or by even not realizing words and actions that hurt rather than heal. Brokenness in family, though, it's not the end. And we know that because I don't care what's happening in your life. Your, your family life is way better than anything that I've been reading. <laughs> and Abraham and Sarah and, and, and Jacob and Isaac and all the rest. I mean, when we, we read that, I go, why would you put that in the Bible? Why don't you just leave those parts out? Well, that's because the Bible's true. You, you, got, you have to speak truth because <laughs> God is the God of truth. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so in that brokenness comes opportunities for growth and healing. We get to see family life at its worst. And, and every time we turn a page of Genesis, there's envy, there's deceit, there's lying, there's cheating. And then that's just the start. And that's why I have a lot of confidence in the message of the Bible, because there's no attempt to hide the flaws of people. No attempt to hide their corruption and deceit. This is real life. So as human beings, as we experience brokenness in our own families, the families that we read about in the Bible are about as broken as you can get. So don't give up hope. There's always hope as you move forward in hopeful ways. Peterson says it's easier to figure out the evil of life and what you shouldn't do rather than to figure out what is good, what we should do. And as we've been learning, it's aiming at the highest good we can. What is the highest ideal for you and for your family? That's a great place to start. You see, the patriarchs commit huge moral error and yet their faith in God moves them forward to good. And we learn that brokenness isn't the end. We can rise up above it. Each of us is called to take aim. What is the highest goal that you have for yourself? Peterson calls this a choice. 
Do you want to aim at the highest good in your life and the highest good for the world, or do you want to make things worse? That's a real question. You see, if, we, if you weren't striving to make things worse, he says, how much better could things be? This is such an important message today. We live in a world where so many people are bent on making things worse for those with whom they disagree. Toxic shaming and predatory behavior are now being lifted up as best practices to move forward. We live in a society where the lack of gratitude is at its peak. Some of the most despicable messages of hatred and anti-Jesus behavior are being taught as moral virtue. Right now, there's training going on all around our land by what can be called the diversity industrial complex. Billions of dollars continue to, to be earmarked and spent on training in some of the most vile, morally depraved teaching you could ever come up with. It's actually shocking. The educational wing of a new religion, a religion of, I don't know what term, there's so many terms now and so many words, they change every day. Uh, wokeness, how's that? The religious of, religion of wokeness, let's call it. Because right now, all around our country, toxic shame and predatory behavior is being spewed through our government institutions, our educational institutions, our corporate institutions, and yes, our church institutions. And in a large part, we're right in the middle of trying to end institutional racism, for example, by replacing it with institutional hatred by using toxic shaming and predatory behavior. Now at LifeHouse, you know what those terms mean. Lord, have mercy. Or we could just call it, the Bible come alive. This is what each of us faces in life. There is a fork in the road. And you can choose a life of anger, bitterness, and resentment, or you can choose a life of committing yourself to being your best true self and making the world a better place in a positive life-giving direction rather than a negative, resentful, and bitter road ahead. You see, it's easier to take the negative fork as a flawed human being, just let you be you. How hard is that? Let you be you as a flawed and sinful human being. That's not hard. We can do that easily. However, if you choose the road of faith, you choose the road of trusting God along the way, it will be much harder but life is hard, remember. Today, I ask you to think of Joseph. This is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks. He worked for his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things his brothers were doing. Oh, no. Here we go again. Come on, Jacob. Things were going so well. You see, Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph a beautiful robe. <sighs> I thought we'd get through one generation without it being messed up. Nope. You see, Joseph is, is an immature brat. He, he's the golden boy of the family, and, and yet... Uh, why... Do the families of the Bible always have to pick favorites? 
Why are parents always favoring a kid? Well, because they're real parents living real life. So Joseph gets a special coat, a robe of many colors, and the favoritism has its usual effect. And what is that? Well, let me read. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. Well, you can see why. Joseph thinks the world revolves around him. Developing, shall we say, narcissistic tendencies. Those might be a little familiar with most of us. Okay? <laughs> then Joseph pours gasoline on the fire of his brother's anger. We read, one night Joseph had a dream. And when he told his brothers about it, they hated him even more than ever. Well, guess why? Listen to this. Listen to this dream, he says. We were out in the field tying up bundles of grain, and suddenly my bundle stood up, and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. His brothers responded, So you think you will be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way he talked about them. Uh-oh, he's going to have another dream. Sure enough, soon Joseph had another dream. And again, he told his brothers all about it. Listen, I have another dream, he said. The sun, moon, and 11 stars bowed low to me. Mm. Sun, moon, Jacob, Rachel, mom and dad, 11 stars, 11 brothers. Are you kidding but this time, he told the dream to his father as well as his brothers. But his father scolded him. What kind of dream is that, he said. Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? But while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered what the dream meant. So Joseph is living in his narcissistic dream world, and even his dad gets ticked off. But his brothers go further than that. Joseph is going to wake up to the real world. Joseph's going to look straight in the eye of all malevolence, all the evil you can muster, everything the world could throw his way. You see, his brothers decide to kill him. That will teach Joseph, bow down before you. How about we kill you? And then they decide to teach Jacob too. Yeah, you're going to play favorites? We're going to kill your favorite. And really, in a, in a real sense, it's their way of spitting in, at the face of God. Ha! Huh, this is what you do to me in life? Let me show you how I'm going to respond. And sure enough, even his brothers don't go through with the killing. Hmm. That's a tiny, tiny bit of hope. They just throw Joseph. <laughs> Where? If you're a princess bride, aficionado, they throw him into the pit of despair. Sure enough, Joseph begins his journey, his journey into malevolence, into all the evil that the world can throw his way. So his brothers don't kill him, but they do their best next thing. He's rescued because they sell him to slave traders. And they buy Joseph for 20 pieces of silver. Hmm, that sounds familiar. Betrayed by silver. Well, Joseph is taken to Egypt. And he begins to grow. Not just physically. He begins to grow in his maturity. Joseph actually follows the teaching of Jesus. Not that he knows who Jesus is yet, but when you face tragic, evil obstacles of life, don't be surprised. Make the best of the situations by being the best. Be like Jesus. And here's how Jesus explains it. 
Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In other words, follow the example of my life. And sure enough, that's just what Joseph does. He bears all the circumstances that will come his way with integrity. He will follow God no matter what. That's his target. That's his aim. The highest good. Follow God. And in the main, he becomes a man of integrity. He will be ruthlessly honest. Not brutally honest. There's a difference. It's not that he's trying to somehow cast aspersions at someone else. No, ruthlessly honest in his own life. Everyone else can cheat, lie, steal, and so forth, but he is not. Unlike all the ancestors before Joseph, he learns the truth to follow the truth, regardless of what evil comes his way. And sure enough, as he looks to God for guidance, he becomes favored in the middle of miserable circumstances. Oh, go figure. Follow God in the midst of miserable circumstances, and good things start coming your way. Yeah, he's a slave, but he becomes the head of his master's household. And his master's wife notices Joseph has grown up too, but not in the way <laughs> that we think about in terms of growing to trust God. He grows up as a handsome young man. She wants to have sex with him. Joseph refuses, and though he follows God's ways, he ends up having the wife make false accusations against him, and Joseph ends up in prison, from slavery to prison. Whoopee! Huh. False accusations, arrest, and prison. I think I've heard that before. So Joseph remains in prison, but he follows God's ways, and he is favored again, and he becomes the head of the prison. And the other prisoners respect him, and even ask him to interpret their dreams. And Joseph, we see as a sign of his maturity, says, no, 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 I don't interpret the dreams God does. Joseph interprets their dreams, and they're accurate, and eventually he's released from prison because the king... The Pharaoh of Egypt wants his dreams interpreted. So Joseph comes to the king and he tells the king, only God can interpret dreams. So let's see what God says. And sure enough, the king listens to Joseph and follows God's interpretation, and Egypt is saved from a devastating famine. See, Joseph is made second in command. He is in rule, in charge of day-to-day -day operations of the most powerful nation in the world at the time. So he moves from a slave to a prisoner to a world leader. And by being a man whose aim is high, following God, and being a man of total integrity and honesty, Joseph brings blessing to those around him. See, the more he blesses others. The more responsibility he receives and the more authority he is given. In God's way of thinking, that's how it goes. The more that God can trust us, the more power God gives us and the more authority we receive to do good in the world, beginning with our own life, the life of those closest to us and then beyond. And sure enough, Joseph rules so wisely that he saves the line of people that God intends to bring blessing to the whole world. See, Joseph becomes this second in command of all of Egypt, and the famine wasn't just in Egypt, it also was in the land where his brothers and his father lived. And his brothers come to him, not knowing that he's their brother. But he knows them, and what does he do? He forgives them. And they become men themselves of honesty 
and integrity too. Even though we are morally suspect, you and I, we can become the kind of people who will seek the truth and who will straighten out and who will be capable to seek good over the time of our lives. See, this is my prayer today. This is my prayer, and these are the actions that I take to continue to commit my life to the truth, seeking the truth at all possible cost, with courage and consideration. I continue to commit my life to service for those who are receptive to invite them to break free of the bondage of this spiraling out of control anger and bitterness and resentment that we see all around us and discover the freedom of following a different road. I think of it this way. Joseph with his brothers, he could have done so many horrible things Evil things, probably you wouldn't even think they're evil because he's just getting back at them, the revenge, and revenge is the ultimate evil. God hates revenge. That's why he says we don't get to have revenge. But what does Joseph do? He blesses his brothers. He increases their blessing in their lives, and they begin to follow him and his ways. This is our choice. You can take the road of Cain. Remember Cain? That's the road of anger and resentment and bitterness and hostility and rage and coercion and violent revenge. Or you can take the road of Joseph. Out of narcissism and immaturity, following the road of aiming higher and higher to become a positive blessing to those around you, following the road of faith, in the midst of your own flaws and the flaws of the world around you. You see, if I can have such a strong love, and yes, Lifehouse, you've heard this term again and again, a strong Hesed love that sticks like glue between God and me, if I can have such a strong love as that, then I can have that kind of love for my enemies. I can be used by God to rescue some. Life is hard. Life is unfair. Evil is present and active. And so I invite you to look back at your life right now. Look back at the evil that was committed against you. Can you join me and look back at all that wasn't fair and wasn't right? Maybe it is the hurt and pain poured on you in your childhood. Maybe it was the evil done toward you, though you tried in your own flawed way to follow God's ways. I invite you to look back and realize that through the hatred that was sent your way, and through the injustice that occurred in your life, and through the hate and hurt that you experience, you can be like Joseph and join him in saying to those seen and unseen people of malevolence, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. You're not going to save anyone if you take the path of Cain. I invite you to join the one who is greater than Joseph, who once said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Here is your choice. Right there. Which road do you want to follow? Which path do you want to take? You can begin today. What's it going to be?
Amen.